so many hours per week in a program mm -hmm. that CDS also pays for. Yeah. So our so it could be, you know, that those two things are kind of intertwined, but they're yeah. and the programming. Right. right. Also part it's of the logistical challenge, yeah. right? Because if some mm -hmm. kids need two hours and some kids need four hours, yeah. you know, it can really. Um, so that's a, a complex one that we're keeping close eye on because obviously mm -hmm. that could have um, major implications for <coughs> our budget um, and also our facilities. We know that we don't have adequate facilities to really have programs that mm -hmm. um, could support all of them. Any other questions about this one? Okay, so something to just keep your ears and eyes open um, for, for. And then there's two other bills regarding career technical education. Um, and so this one here actually, I, I updated it, but it, it doesn't look like it updated here. That's actually LR 2731. The LD 1733 has been withdrawn. Um, and then the other one is this um, LR 2727, which is about um, membership in career technical education regions and centers. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a ton of information on those yet. <coughs> um, I'm not sure if they're, if they're losing momentum or gaining momentum because they, we don't have um, LD numbers for those mm -hmm. specifically. But we're keeping an eye out for those, knowing that um, promoting career technical education is a priority of this department. Uh, of our current leadership in the Department of Education. Um, a couple others that are carryover bills from last session, um, and if you look at the MSBA report that Jackie mentioned at our last meeting, I don't know if you've all had a chance to look at that. LD40 is one that MSA, um, MSBA supports or plans to re-support, and then the other bill um, listed there about the uh, general fund bond issue to recapitalize the school revolving renovation fund. Um, that one was also one that was recommended that the MSBA plans to support. Um, and the last one that you see here, again, is talking about career and technical education. This is one also that MSBA's legislative committee plans to support. And so I'm just really putting these out here for you to see some of the language and some of the numbers so that as they come up, um, you can be staying attuned. And then, of course, there's just um, linking into this document, you can get more detailed information. But then also um, on the MSCA uh, website, there's a there's little paragraph about each one. But we're not going to dig into those too deep tonight. Here's a couple of new bills um, that we're also keeping an eye on. Of course, um, LD 1666 is about proficiency-based diplomas. Um, and this bill really delays the timeline for the implementation for one year. So if you remember, the current law said that um, beginning with the class of 2021, which is our current freshmen, they would be um, required to demonstrate proficiency in the four core areas, ELA, math, social studies, and science. And so what this bill is asking for is a delay in that timeline because we still the rulemaking is still underway for the proficiency-based diplomas. Um, and so just to understand our position um, as superintendents in Maine, we think that we're doing the right work and that we're on the right path. And so we want to stay the course. Um, but there's some mixed feelings about the delayed implementation of the timeline. So it'll be interesting to watch that and see what happens um, with that. That's not the first delay. Right. In, like, yeah. it, it, this is a delay in a series of delays. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And, and couldn't people also get, could some schools say they weren't ready and they could delay, like did not all schools started this year, correct? Did some get a permission to delay? This was the drop, this is the, de the delay to the delay already. But they so couldn't get permission to delay, delay further. No. no. Oh, okay. okay. Some, okay. Are, some were already ready, oh, okay. so to speak. Um, and for previous graduating classes, personally here in Scarborough, um, we are on track for class of 2021, but we're still figuring some things out too, so we don't think a delay would have a negative effect. We would still continue to do the work that we're doing. Um, but we also think that if we stayed the course, um, we'll be ready, 
you know, to issue proficiency-based diplomas as soon as we have the rules from the department about what that looks like. Specifically for, um, one of the big questions that we have is, you know, what happens with students who have IEPs, um, which are individualized education plans. Um, we believe, and I think we've discussed this in, um, in previous conversations, um, but internally we believe that all students should have um, the opportunity to earn a diploma and that if they are meeting the goals of their IEPs and they are attending school as they are required and um, fully participating and engaging in their programs to the best of their abilities that they should also be, have a chance to earn diplomas. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a tangled up one right now. But so yeah. if they choose to delay another mm -hmm. year, does that mean next year's incoming freshmen will still be just the four? Or would they, because remember how we were, it was sort of going to be the next year was going to be four five, versus four plus another, four yeah. plus one, and then the following year is going to be <coughs> four plus two. Do we just sort of hang strong at just the core? So it's, so. It, I guess it depends how it gets worked out in committee. Um, if it was, if it does go through, because those I believe would be some of the decisions that they would That's be making. Me. Right. Um, Julie, mm -hmm. it, I think there are two major problems that are being discussed and the cause for possible delay. One is, as Julie said, uh, special s students and the IEP. There are a number of people who don't believe meeting an IMP. Uh, an IEP. <laughs> Should should we uh, should allow for a diploma because that's not proficiency. So that's one controversy. What is proficient, and is should it be proficiency for all students? Doesn't mean that that youngsters with an IEP should not complete high school. That's not the question at all. The question is, do they earn a diploma? Right. <clears throat> That's number one. The second part is students who are doing primarily the technical piece. Mm -hmm. and, and is there an opportunity for those youngsters to complete uh, their proficiencies in all that they wish to do, both academic and technical, in the allotted time, that the same amount of time that uh, the average student would be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that uh, that are concerning communities. There's a side piece here that people in the greater Portland, greater Augusta, greater Bangor areas can get together for training and and exchange of ideas and help each other out. But when you get to the rural communities who are self-contained, so to speak, they're having difficulty getting their staff trained and training the parents and students as well on what this actually means. So there's a real pushback uh, on this from a lot of people across the state of Maine, mm -hmm. not southern Maine. So those are the three items that I heard uh, at, at my last uh, Maine school board's meeting concerning this item. Well, and what's interesting, Jackie, is um, at the last legislative meeting, superintendent's legislative meeting, um, it was reported that the Penquist region um, feels that the delay would is appropriate because we were not able to provide freshmen with very clear guidelines and expectations due to the lack of rules um, from the DOE where Aristic County is not in favor of the delay, of delaying at all. So it's, it's interesting to see and I think part of it for me is that like the benefit of having a deadline is that if We'll, we'll keep massaging it and wanting it to be perfect, and if we keep delaying it, delaying it, delaying it until we get it all figured out, then we're never going to actually be doing the work 
where if we take an improvement cycle mindset that we're going to make a plan, we're going to do the work, we're going to study it, we're going to adjust based on what we know is working and not, and we can be flexible in that space while also enhancing opportunities for kids, then we should stick to the, we should stay the course. Um, so there's, I think that's why you have such mixed feelings about it. Um, because either way, whether we stay the course or we extend a year, um, the work is the same. We're going to be doing the same work, if that makes sense, from an internal standpoint. I do have a question about the IEPs. Is there, are they drawing any distinction between the types? Because there's like a 504, which is making reasonable accommodations, mm -hmm. and then there's the true educational track ones. Mm -hmm. Are they saying that anybody with an IEP will not get a diploma? Mm -mm. No. No. Okay. no. I think that um, even, so true, there are 504s, um, a 504 is a, a civil rights document that ensures that when you have a, dis a, a medical or physical disability, you have equal access. Um, an IEP is, um, is a federal law. It's a, a federal mandate, and that um, ensures that all students have a free and appropriate education, right? And so even you can have an IEP for a specific learning disability. Uh, there's like 13 different, you know, categories that one could be classified for and have an IEP. There's a really broad category that's other health impaired. Some are really specific to like hearing impairment or visual impairment. Um, so you could have an IEP for any of those reasons and you could be very high functioning, um, very capable and able um, to being really restricted and needing lots of accommodations and um, modifications to the actual curriculum. So typically with a 504, you're providing accommodations to, to create access, um, where with an IEP, um, oftentimes it requires some sort of modification to the program or the curriculum, okay. if that makes sense. But there's still a wide range of, you know, severe needs um, to minimal just support that is written within an IEP, and that's why it's individualized, because it's based on each individual student. And then within that, and within every IEP, there's goals that are set that are aligned to the standards. Um, but the argument, or I guess the debate is that if I have a cognitive delay um, and you, or I have, um, a, a, let's just say, a cognitive delay or impairment and you know, we know that my IQ is such that I may never be able to be, demonstrate proficiency in, say, like an Algebra 2, then what's a diploma look like for me? Okay. Right? But that would be like one case now. now. We wouldn't, those kids are still getting a diploma now. Mm -hmm. So why, why are we thinking that it's okay to sort of change the rules? So, I mean, um, I know we're not. We right, think right. that they right. should have a school. I think the, the difference is the expectation of proficiency, yep. right? And so it's how are we going to define proficiency? And are we going to define that as meeting these <coughs> specific standards? Um, or are we going to define proficiency in another way? And so that's... That's where the, there's enough flexibility in the law that gives local decision to define what proficiency means. Um, and so there's a debate also about, well, should that be a local decision or should that be a statewide decision? Should we get to decide which standards um, students have to demonstrate proficiency in or should the state be telling us, you know, here's the non-negotiables for this course or this grade? It's interesting because you hear all these people talk about Oh, proficiency base is just everyone is just going to be low, you know, dumbing it down, all of this stuff. But to me, it sounds much more rigorous than what is actually currently happening. Absolutely. Done well, that is exactly what the intent is. It makes the instruction much, much more explicit and intentional, transparent to the learner. So no more are students like guessing what is it that I need to do. If this is what we're saying an exemplar looks like, let's give them an example of that so that they can then meet that expectation. Um, but it is much more rigorous. May I give an example? Sure. I taught physical education for a lot of years. And there were students who came to my physical education class who may have been able to bounce the ball, but they never could have put the ball in the basket. They couldn't run well. 
but they interacted, they got there, they were on time, they behaved themselves, they passed physical education. If I had to rank them on proficiency in each of the activities that we offered for physical education, and I taught K-12, so it doesn't matter what the grade level is. I had standards, we had standards for each grade level. But there were some children who would never be able to reach the most minimum standard of almost any activity in, in physical education for various reasons. Doesn't mean they shouldn't be given consideration, but you can't say that they are proficient in the activity. And the same thing is, is happening, excuse me, in academics. They do their best. They show up, <laughs> behave themselves, they interact, but they can never, or oh, probably would never pass the most minimum proficiency test in the activity. I, yeah, I hear you, but it, it's fascinating to me that the perception is, is 180 degrees versus reality mm -hmm. in this, in that those students passed physical education for showing up. Well, they right. participated to the best of their ability. But they didn't, they didn't do, they didn't have to perform the same as the average Correct. typical student to get an A. Correct. But that's what the IEP is saying. It's, it's Correct. Right. We've already seen that you're individualizing the curriculum to their ability. To their ability. So if they can meet what their proficiency for their IEP is, Check, right? right? Like, and that's yeah. their that's their you know um, bar of proficiency. It might not be the same as an average student. And remember, the uh, big part of this transition to proficiency is also that we're separating out those habits of work. You show up. You're responsible, right? You're respectful. We're separating out those habits of work, um, and we're rating them separately from the knowledge and skills that you're obtaining um, and even further than separating out guiding principles which are those adaptive skills that we all look for in every person we like to interact with and work with and um, socialize with, right? That those 21st century skills. And so that's a big shift too because before every teacher sort of mixed those things up and weighted them whichever way they philosophically and pedagogically believed to be what was best. And so we're also trying to, in this transition, not only make it more rigorous, more intentional, and more explicit, we're also trying to ensure that grades are consistent and accurate and reliable. Um, predictors of what students know and can do, or not predictors, but um, communications of what kids can know and do. Does that make sense? But it's, I think it's interesting. What, I had not heard that at all, the dumbing down. Uh, a lot. I hear it a lot. In reference to profici proficiency based, mm -hmm. because that's really opposite of what right. the intent really is with the law. But what will be interesting, if the towns are allowed to decide each district decides proficiency, then does that cause families to jump around and say, well, my kid wouldn't be able to make it here, but I could go over to mm -hmm. the town next door, and I know in that program yeah. they'd get a diploma. <laughs> you know? So, right. so it'll be interesting to see how it all yeah, I, I haven't down, heard yeah. the dumbing down, but I have heard people saying, well, once you meet the proficiency, what's the motivation for going beyond that? Right. I, I think that we hear a lot, um, well, if there's no honor roll and well, if there's no number that you're working for, then what are you working for? And, right, exactly. So once you've got the three, you why the, get a four? Right. Yeah. You make the, uh, the average and then you're good enough and why would yeah. you try to do Right. Stretch. Yeah. right, right. Whereas, like, if you a three right now with a ninety, maybe you want to, you know, get that ninety-nine. And mm -hmm. where in the intent behind um, the transition also is really to ask <coughs> two questions about every learner every day, every class, 
what does Julie know, what is she ready to learn? So if a student comes in knowing, because that happens now, right? Some kids come in knowing. You can have one student who's working really, really hard and not getting a passing grade on the 0 to 100 scale. And you could have one student who comes in knowing and doesn't have to put forth very much effort and could have, you know, a 90 or a 100, right? And so that's the other thing that we're trying to balance is really looking at where are you and where do you need to go? So that differentiation of instruction is a huge part of it too. And that's what I think from the implementation side of it is the challenge because it requires teachers to have a lot of um, skills in terms of providing interventions daily for every student. Um, and so that's done well. That's also an outcome that we hope to achieve in this transition. Well, the understanding of the uh, content is going to be different because now sometimes people uh, you do your homework, will put in, you know, 100 points because you did that. So you could have a grade that's really kind of inflated in some ways that is not really measuring what you know because of that 100 being added in. Mm -hmm. So there will be habits of work mm -hmm. and the prof proficiency part. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens, sorry, this is just a, probably a question just for our district, or maybe kind of maybe not. But what happens when you have somebody who is incredibly proficient and has horrible howls? Horrible what? Habits, <laughs> habits of work and oh, learning. Yeah. They still graduate. Like well, then we haven't taught them those skills. That well, the goal is that. Um, well, that's a really great question, actually, right? Philosophically, to think about. If I don't, I think. It'd be hard to see a student who's not responsible, not respectful, not ready to learn, um, and also achieving really high levels of proficiency. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, then we have to ask ourselves if they can do all, uh, is it rigorous enough? Maybe we need to make some accommodations for Julie, provide some intervention to provide enrichment for her if she can do all these things and not um, be demonstrating these positive habits of work and learning. And so that's a, a teachable moment, right? That's an opportunity for teachers to intervene and really provide that support. It's not something where we would be like, oh, gee, your grades are good, or you're, um, you're demonstrating proficiency in these areas, so we're not going to worry about that. Mm -hmm. We're just going to then provide intervention that's specific to helping the student demonstrate those skills or learn those skills if they don't yet have them. But there could be cases where that happens. Right. But the, the diploma is based on their proficiency, not their character. Um, we are we are not required by law currently to um, provide grades for habits of work and learning. Um, we're <coughs> providing marks to students as a form of feedback and communication. But we are required the guiding principles and the the content ratings are are part of the law. So those are those are the two that will be required to be. Um, reporting out on. And you have to demonstrate proficiency in both the content standards and the guiding principles to obtain proficiency, a proficiency-based diploma. So you could be proficient in a class, but you would have, you still have to demonstrate proficiency. And the idea is that by making learning less about sitting in a seat and getting X number of hours in the classroom, by making it more about educational learning experiences, that could look really different. So a huge part of the law is not just the shift to proficiency, um, but it's also then what are the different pathways and different opportunities for students to demonstrate that proficiency. So it really moves away from this sort of one-size-fits-all traditional measure of success, if that makes sense. And also I think you can imagine that if these kind of discussions are held in different all the different towns, you can begin to think about even teachers come from different programs, mm -hmm. different philosophies about pedagogy and different ways in which they handle their class and how they score their kids. And so then you need all this time to have these huge discussions in order to arrive at yeah, and part of it is we have to just start doing it, right? And so we've learned a lot from the beginning of the year till now, and there's some things that we thought were going to be the best way to do things that now we're at the ending, the end of the second semester, and we've learned, we've learned a lot, 
um, and what some folks are ready to hear in September, others are going to be more ready to hear in February. Um, and that's just how learning goes, right, with adult learners or student learners. So um, really for this, the only thing that this is proposing is that delay for one year. And, you know, you could take sort of a neither for or against I kind of feel neither for or against it um, because I know our work is going to be the same regardless, but boy, it sure would be great to have clear rules from the DOE on what this means because then I think it allows us to start creating more clarity for folks. Um, for all I think we would be hard pressed in a court of law to deny a diploma if a student demonstrates proficiency in the, in the course work. So would this still have um, significant benefits to other districts that aren't us? Um, well, everyone had to have it. This is the this was the drop drop the, you know that you had to have right. when it started. So right. they should have. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's other districts who started four years ago. Mm -hmm. we, we took the delay. Right. And some districts took the delay because they just thought, like, well, this is so complex, like, this is going to go away, right. honestly. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like at the point now where it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> there are still away. people who think it's going to there, go away. Yeah, there, oh, yeah. There. Um, so that's that one to so just kind of watch. Um, it's interesting <coughs> to see what, what will come from the Department of Ed in the meantime. This one here, um, LD 1710, is um, the Act to Restore Maine School-Based Health Care Health Centers. This doesn't impact Scarborough directly, but it's something that um, we certainly support for some students in some districts, such as Portland. It's the only health care that they have access to. And so I think this is a definite, in my mind, I don't know what your opinions are, um, something that should be restored. Eliminate the funding 100% actually. I believe so. I think they did. I believe so. I'm sorry, Jackie. I asked if they eliminated that funding 100% from the state, and the answer was, was yeah, yes to that for the, the school based clinics. Yes, I think the the last days of the budget, all the, all the funding went. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Any other questions about that one? Um, this is an interesting one. LD 1689 is the act to repeal certain provisions regarding the system administration allocation affecting Maine school districts in the biennial budget. So if you remember, I've talked to you a couple of times about the regional service centers. Um, and so what this is actually, um, it, basically when we were first when we first learned about the regional service centers and the application process, we were told one number, and then the number has been changed. And so now, um, I think it was like $200 per student, and now it's like $46 per student um, in year one, and $94 per student in year two. And I think part of the challenge with this is that the Department of Education is calling it an incentive, um, but in essence, it's also a penalty, because if you don't apply, you don't get that funding in your system administration. Um, and so again, it feels a little um, unfair that the rules are changing in the middle of the game. And so we currently applied for two regional service center applications um, and we're looking to combine and consolidate that into one at the end of this month as we consider applying for the second phase of the application, which is due in April. Um, so this is, there's actually a public hearing on this next week. Um, and the public hearing starts at 1 o'clock and the other one we're going to talk about is also next week. Um, so again, I think What's hard about this one for me, um, as I'm still kind of learning how things work here in Maine, is that we already share services with Cape Elizabeth. We share a food service director. We're already a part of a um, food service per a co-op for purchasing um, food service produce. Um, we already share services with our town. We already share services with the Sebago Education Alliance in terms of professional development, recruitment um, strategies, and a number of other things. And so um, for me, this just is counter to everything we know about motivation, and it makes it about compliance and people jumping through hoops 
not to mention the amount of time and resources it takes for you to really create these interlocal agreements on such a mass scale. Um, I was talking with a superintendent today um, who's in a, who applied for a different application and he said he spent probably 10 hours of his own time plus legal fees in trying to just create an interlocal, an interlocal agreement for their um, application. And so, again, the goal here, the department's intentions are good. They want us to be as efficient as possible so more money can go directly into the classroom. Um, and it's just kind of an insult because that's our job to begin with. I, at least that's my opinion about it. So that's another one to keep an eye on and see what's happening. Any questions about this one? Do you have any sense on like why they changed it? Why is it why they want to change it? They um, don't have the money, but not enough money. It's enough money. So 19, I believe 19 applications were submitted. And so part of the messaging is that um, there's th there's this great interest. So if it, they were to repeal the um, the provisions that you know, it would be discouraging to the districts, but in fact, we all applied because if we didn't, it was going to negatively, negatively impact our students and the fact that we would get less state subsidy. So I think it's a, just an, an interpretation of what we had to do in order to ensure that we're maximizing the formula for each of our districts versus um, what, how they're interpreting it. And remember, it's all coming from the same pie, if you will. There's no more money being added to the budget. And so the more districts that apply that are getting the $46 per kid per student, the less money that's going to run through the formula. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, you know, trying to take a pie and say there's enough for, right? My pie analogy. Okay. Any other questions about that one? All right, the other um, new bill is LD 1761, and this is an act regarding the prohibition of the possession of a firearm on school property. And this is the one that I thought um, we could spend some time really talking about today and maybe developing our position on this. So um, what this basically allows is for um, a parent, let's say, hypothetically, to be um, dropping their child off from school and having like a gun rack in their vehicle. So currently, firearms are not allowed on school property, um, but this would allow them to have it in their possession, in their vehicle, um, or a staff member, for that matter, um, or anyone else who's on school grounds. And so uh, I thought this would be a good one for us to talk about and sort of debate and get your thoughts about it. So when I read this one, it was um, that it needed to be locked in the car, and um, you know, basically, on the, do you have the details on the? Yeah, I'm gonna, I have it on a different slide. So at the present time, here it is. The prohibition is you can't bring a gun on school property. Right. No matter what. Right. Exactly. And and John Martin introduced this, I believe because there are, again, more rural communities, you know, especially even students, you know, have, have guns in their cars. But the incentive for this bill is this, that if a parent is called to pick up their child, let's say their child is ill or whatever it happens to be, and the father has to come from work, but he went hunting before he went to work, and he's got the gun. He does, can't go home and drop the gun before he goes to pick up the child. That's just a little synopsis. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to add to the detail I misspoke earlier, it does say specifically that it would allow the person to possess it as long as the person is dropping off or picking up and remains in the car um, and that the gun is not loaded and it is in a locked container or a locked firearms rack. So you couldn't be a student and park your car in the parking lot with a weapon in your vehicle um, and you couldn't be a staff member doing the same 
this says you would have to stay in the car, which poses issues for picking up and dropping off. Depending on the age of your child, we don't just send them out um, to their parents either. So. Yeah. It so seems like this one would be hard to, as as it stated there, it would be hard to say for sure that doesn't happen already. Already, mm -hmm. I mean, because it's uh, such a controlled um, situation. Right. No one is going to the person's car. Right. To no. see mm -hmm. if they have anything in the car before they allow the students out. Well, and most people can't pick up their kid without coming into the school most of the time. You can't get your kid out in the lot unless it's after school and you've told your kid and you're out there waiting. In other words, you can't pick up your kid early before school gets out without coming in. The, in. So if there was another person in the car, I suppose. I mean, it's all, how do you manage this? If it went through, how would you manage it? Well, yeah. that, that was a major discussion at, at the main school board's legislation committee mm -hmm. that uh, most parents would have to leave the car right. to pick up the child mm -hmm. or to take the child to school in, in some instances. And uh, the majority of people uh, on our committee are opposed. There are members of the board of directors, not the legislative committee, but the board of directors, who who think uh, this is okay, and it, it depends on the community from where they come. Mm -hmm. It's common in those communities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I said to one man who was who was in favor of this, I said, "Well, why can't you just take the gun out of the rack and put it behind your seat?" I mean, you're not supposed to have it there, but at least it's not visible, you know. He said, well, then you'd be lying. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you want to pick up your child? It's going to be locked. Right. I'd rather have it locked than behind somebody's seat. So has locked. there been, an, well, from what you can understand, has there been an issue with a parent going there with a gun, gun rack, rack and then, like, you know, has someone kind of what I was wondering evidently come evidently. into a legal situation because of it? Evidently. Yes. In Northern Maine. I'm not aware. My understanding is that there was a similar bill that was proposed last year and it was defeated, um, but I don't know of any specific incident. I don't know if anyone else has heard of a specific incident. It seems like they're legislating for something that's not some, like an issue. Well, my new possibility. It's also con contrary to the state law. If we're an open carry state, it especially in the rural communities, how, I'm just questioning how they can, how can they have this in there? Somebody could have a sidearm, not a gun rack gun, but you know, a pistol or something along the way. Not on school grounds. So the, the difference is that right now you are not allowed to have a firearm on school property. Period. Now, so that trumps, period. That trumps the law. That that trumps the and law. so, right, just like okay. you're not allowed to smoke on school grounds, right? You could think of it in that same way. You can smoke all you want, everywhere, you know, at home and wherever, but at, on school property. And so my, my personal standpoint on this is that schools are sacred places. Um, our number one job is to ensure that students are safe. Um, we have a big job of making sure that 2,925 students are safe every day, 29 students are safe every day when they come to us, while they're with us, until they get home. And this just, there's a difference between you doing it and us not knowing about it mm -hmm. and us saying it's allowable mm -hmm. for me. I just feel like there's a bright line there. Um, so but who's that's my held personal. responsible if something, if this passed and a parent came and picked up their kid and had to go into the school, sign their child out, and somebody else drives by and says, oh, Mr. Smith just left his car with the gun in the gun rack. Who's responsible, Mr. Smith or the Scarborough School Department? I'm not sure. It doesn't, I don't have that level of detail at this point, but the, this is the reason why they have public hearing is because they want people to come and say these things or propose these um, scenarios in testimony. 
Um, and so there is a public hearing next Wednesday, um, and I put the details there for you. The Education um, Committee will address this and will hear testimony. And so we could choose to, I don't know folks' availability, you could choose to go and testify in person. You could, we could decide as a school board if we have a certain position that we want to um, send a written testimony and ask for it to be read by one of our legislators. Um, or you could choose not to have a position on this at all. But I just thought that this was a timely issue that we might have opinions on and thought we could utilize our workshop today to sort of unpack that a little. Main school boards is opposed to it, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're opposed to this bill. Yes. As are the superintendents, I mean, superintendents association. Well, is there anyone here on the board that thinks that they might be able to support that? I can understand what Jackie's saying about different areas of the state. I have lots of family in central Maine who are hunting enthusiasts and also really great parents of school-age kids, and I can very well imagine this situation happening for them. And for them, I would say, fine, <laughs> you know. I'm not in favor of having guns on school property in general, but I can understand how in different areas of the state it's harder. I mean, well, actually, I have a neighbor here who goes and hunts. You know, on the marsh sometimes before school starts. And he's also a police officer. I'm sure he's very I'm responsible. Just an ask about um, law enforcement and so they may not drop children off them. So on one hand, if I'd much officer. rather have it be in a locked case or a locked law gun rack rather than saying just hide it under your seat, you know? Like, so... <laughs> That's a good question. But I'm also not... in. On principle, I don't want guns on school property, so I, I don't know, I'm really I'm a little ambivalent on it, actually. So why don't we take a few minutes. Um, I just put these two bullets up here, and I have some scratch paper if you want to start to sketch out some of your ideas or your thoughts. Um, just what are some questions to consider, because you're bringing up some really good points. Um, and are there, you know, do you have strong beliefs that, that you also um, are, are thinking about in relation to this bill in particular. Mm -hmm. Exempt from the firearms on school property. Is it resource just officer any police officer or just the school resource officer? Um, well, I think it would matter if they're on or off duty. Right. Um, but our school resource officers are able to carry weapons. Just talking about this bill, Julie. Yes. Yeah. Just this one. Unless there's another one that you're thinking, you know, you're having passion about, you could also jot some thoughts about that. Is there a federal law like prohibiting any of this? Yes. Guns on school property? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So is this like going around that somehow? Like, what's the federal law currently? I'm not sure. That's a good I question. I don't know. Well, I mean, there may have been laws at some point, though. but they might have been overturned by Lopez. Uh, by what? Lopez B. B. A. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. On, on school property. Right. Good question. Yeah, it does look like there's a federal law. Gun Free School Zones Act. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a perfect example would be medical marijuana, right? So legalized in Maine, but not federally legalized. And that creates complications for us in terms of policy and implementation, right? So that's a, an example of where you have a federal law that says it's not legal, and then you have a state law that says it is. Give us like five minutes to sort of drop some thoughts. Then you can talk to people around you. It doesn't have to be completely <laughs> quiet. I'll tell you too that it is much more powerful when board members speak than when superintendents speak. I mean, superintendents represent schools, but we are the elected officials and and uh, legislators are more moved by speaking with elected officials as opposed to employees. Do we know when 
that law, gun free zone, school zones can't go. 1990. Because, I mean, Keith and Scarborough used to hunt before school, Joanne, right. and drive to school with their guns in their trucks. Uh, I thought I was did you like, do hallucinating. That? I did not. I'm not a gun person, <laughs> but I have family that has lived here a very long time, and that we were rural Maine. This right. Scarborough was oh, absolutely that town, and so uh, I don't know. It's just it's. I don't have a strong opinion either way. I'm not a gun person. I don't think guns should be on school property, but. I think this would be a nightmare to try to regulate. Well, how is it regulated now? So that would be a question that we would want to consider, right? How will we monitor compliance of this proposal? So if we're, if we're saying that it's allowable, but you have to be in your vehicle, you can't, I mean, it's only for pickup and drop off, like how are we going to monitor that? That is a big question that I right. have. Right. But how is it monitored now? Well, number one. Uh, well, it's no, monitored in that if you see something, you say something, right? The assumption is that there are. But if you do have a behind you, you have it behind your seat. There might be. Nobody's going to know. I think it's scarier to think about that. I think it's scarier yeah, to think about a loose gun in a car than a locked gun in a car. I'd rather have no guns in the car, <laughs> however. Right. But if that, so well, an accident happens, let's say that the parent had the. You know, if an accident happened in the car mm -hmm. on school property, mm -hmm. how does that like how is that liability? I don't know. That to me, that's another thing that. Well, technically, that would still be against this law because it has to be unloaded, right? Locked, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you have to remain in your vehicle. So, if yeah. any of those three three things aren't mm -hmm. adhered to, it's still going to be against the your. Yeah. But the, to me, like the, to me, the biggest thing is there is no way to. I, I don't believe in guns. That I, I wouldn't want guns anywhere on school property. But the feasibility part of it, I don't see how you can. Like if you're picking up your child, like we said, in the middle of the day, there is no way you can stay in your car and go pick up your child unless you know you have someone with you. But it doesn't seem like you'd be able to do that. Just say no guns. Like yeah. can't that just be enough? Well, that is the current law, right? Mm -hmm. No that guns on school property. Sure. This would allow for, this would be us crossing that bright line and saying you can have guns on school property if you do these things. And we believe, I believe strongly that it is just, our job is to keep schools as safe as possible. And we know that tragedies involving guns on school property are not unimaginable. It's mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And so how can we, in light of that, and I feel the same way about medical marijuana when we're in the midst of an opioid crisis, how can we legalize marijuana? But I, you know, I just don't see how those two messages coexist, um, us saying that we're going to make schools as safe as possible, and then us saying in some situations you can do these things, because we know that whenever you, it just opens up the door for that right, law. It starts, it starts the slope. Right. And then it is. It's a whole other thing to manage. So when somebody does pull up and then they come in to get their child and there's clearly, you know, a gun and a gun rack that, that we can see and it's visible, what happens then? Who enforces that? Right. Who's, who's the who's person that has to say, your yeah. son can't go home with you today? Right. Yeah. You can't come in. To well, I don't think that would happen. What I think would, would happen is that somebody would, would involve law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And, and I think a parent would say, arrest me, I'm here to pick up my child. Uh, but who really intervenes at that point while the law enforcement is coming? Would you ask a teacher or an administrator to Not restrain us. somebody until the police came? No, I think, I think they have to report it. Yeah. yeah. The enforcement it just creates a nightmare. Correct. Of issues. Okay. And was this was this, be here. was this put forth by like the NRA or anyone associated with NRA? No, this is John Martin from uh, Eagle, Lake, Eagle Lake. Eagle Lake. Who's right. been in the legislature yeah. longer than I've been on the school board. Yeah, I think in light of the slippery slope argument, I can see just saying let's not cross that line for sure. So to me, it's like you go, okay, you get this, and then it's like, okay, right, there's, there's a next, yeah, there's, the next yeah, there's another law that 
okay, it's okay to have guns in school if you are, you know, I, I just think that that's, that's to me where it would head next. I think, I guess, in light of, like, discussing the fact that we don't really have any enforcement now, or, I mean, you know, like, it, other than if you see something, you say something. I mean, there's no, like, policy or... There's a law yeah. that says you can't do it. Right, but there's... We don't have people checking. Do and we? You see it. No. You would. Right. Right. So, but I guess my point is that there's no way to monitor this either, really, without changing the way we do things. So why don't we just... I guess my opinion is to leave it with just no guns on school property. Yeah. I think if you really are that, like, really are, like, pulled away from hunting, then I'd rather have you spend the extra 20 minutes going home and dropping it off and then coming to get your kid where they're safe in the nurse's office mm -hmm. than just rushing to school with, like, your weapons still on you. Like, <laughs> I just, I feel like it is such a small minority, like, I can't drop your gun at the police station. <laughs> then come yeah, get I, back to the police station. <laughs> and then I just go back to like, you know, when we were kids, our parents did not have cell phones. So if your parents were out shopping when you were sick, you just waited in the nurse's office, and that was okay. You know what I mean? So, you know what I mean? You waited for an hour in the nurse's office because they couldn't reach them. You know what I mean? And, and that's okay if it takes a little longer, you've got to drop off your gun first. You know? So I guess, you know, I think for this board, it's, it's can we arrive at an agreement tonight where we we could make a statement on this possible bill that is in the legislature, or, or do we feel like I mean you can we can individually you can individually contact legislators you know our legislators from Scarborough mm -hmm. we did we don't have to make a joint statement so it's a question of whether or not we we all would use even want to make that agreed upon statement and then what the wording would be. So personally, I, I mean, since I haven't said anything about it, it's, I'm, I'm just against guns, period. I'm against guns in terms of the laws in this current state about carrying guns as well. I just don't think there should be guns available. And when I looked at the research, so this was a few years ago for schools, it was like if if you have a gun in your home, it's like twice as likely that someone in your home will be accidentally shot with that gun. Have I got, does anybody know yes. anything different than yes. that? I know you're obviously It's like mm -hmm. yes. significantly Well, we had a tragedy right here in Scarborough in right. just recently. That's right. It wasn't one of our school-age children, but it was a school-age child, and it happened in a home in Scarborough. They had a weapon in the house, and accidentally, because it's never on, no. Well, not usually on purpose. Um, the child lost their life. I think the board should take a position against the against this bill. Well, I think only if we're all in agreement. I wouldn't want to take a position if not every member felt the same. Okay. And is there a reason why we're choosing this bill? Like, is it just? The reason why I offered this is just the timeliness of the public hearing Got coming this next Wednesday. Um, I would encourage you to do this type of work frequently. Um, as Jackie said, your voice is really powerful, um, and there's big decisions that are being discussed, or big bills that are being discussed, every, not just this year, but every year. Um, but I think that's part of our job as school boards is to um, advocate for what we think is best for our students and um, you know, advocating at the state level is one of the the best or one of the the most um, the largest impacts you can have on some of the mandates and decisions that get handed down to us. That then, of course, impact all of our students. So, what I'm hearing is um, from Jackie, you'd like to see the board take a position. From Hillary, you probably would not want to see that happen unless all of us came to some agreement. I think if all of us are in agreement, I would be comfortable having the board take a position. But if we're not, I guess then I, I'm not comfortable. If somebody analyst. disagrees, then mm -hmm. yeah. And then the board's decision. You know, you have to you yeah. end up having to support something you might. Right. Not. You want it to be able to say right. the Scarborough School Board. So I'm fine. I'm I'm fine um, with. Um, 
opposing it and the board I'm fine with that too. Yeah, I feel like uh, before deciding that we're all in agreement, we should have a specific like statement that we would have in mind that we would be agreeing upon mm -hmm. before saying that we're in agreement on it. That's how I think about yeah, it. Yeah, I think that that would be a good next step, but I've wanted to have a sense before we even spend time writing it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a sense well, that... Well, even just like a simple statement. Yes. As in, well, I think uh, it's... Simply opposed by the bill as a whole, mm -hmm. or the wording, or the, uh, mm -hmm. something as simple as that. Yeah. Um, just to make it clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think the language can be tweaked to make sure everyone's comfortable if we decide to do it. I, I, def and I definitely oppose it strongly because I just think our job is to keep kids safe and that just goes against it completely. Two stands. Two. Uh, the law stands is the law stands. And I'm fine with, um, I'm fine in either direction. I think that opening it up, yes, is a huge slope that you never know what's going to come next. I think my bigger question is how are we, how is that law being enforced? Right. And how would this one be enforced? So um, at this point we're talking about, um, we, don't, we don't know how it would be enforced, so we're talking about where each one of us feels in the ability to support a statement, a simple statement that is against this LB 1761. And so I was. I, I'm, I'm comfortable opposing it. I think in light of the difficulty of monitoring the um, just the slippery slope argument about what might come next, and like you were saying, Donna, the statistical likelihood mm -hmm. of accidents where that's a presence, mm -hmm. I would be happy to. And it's perfectly um, appropriate for you to have a position to say you oppose it because and then have these questions that are unanswered by the current language. That's definitely something that I've observed. I'm sure Jackie, you've observed that in people's um, testimonies. So I think, I think I'm hearing that this board could support a statement around this to um, basically keep the law as it is and not make this addition to opening up the possibility of guns and cars. That we heard. The question, however, would have to be to either support or oppose the bill. The bill, yeah. yeah. And so you're not saying support the federal law. You're no. saying we either support LD 1761 right or we oppose LD 1761 because of the following. And it could be, you know, for me, it would be how will we monitor and comply, this, comply to this mm -hmm. proposal. Um, I can imagine situations where a gun, a car, a gun may be left in a car and it's unattended. What are the implications of that? You know, simple, for this example right here, talking about pick up and drop off, well, I guess 90 Five percent of the time, with the exception of maybe some high school students, the parents are getting out of the car. Yep. So it almost creates an illusion of some sort of added right, but the reality mm -hmm. is that it just puts then, I think, our parents in a situation where I'm allowed to do this, but then I also need to go in and get my child, and so now I have this, like, There's ethical no dilemma. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah. do we want to just compose a statement here? I mean, it, it looks to me like it would be pretty easy to compose a statement because we're just speaking to that bill. The Scarborough Board of Education opposes LD7, the implementation of LD 1761 uh, based on the following concerns. Well, the bill, we just speak to those specific things. You, I can type it like You can type it, okay. So it would just be the Scarborough Board of Education Opposes LD 1761, guns on school property. This is the uh, guns for youth zone act. It looks like the current law basically says 1761. That this one allows them to cars and racks. So this is basically. Um, and then I would put, um, uh, we are concerned about the following. 
Okay, for the following reasons. Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah, okay, for the following reasons. Uh, number one, um, student safety is our number one. I know my cousin's next to me. Goal for all students. Your number one priority, yeah. I don't think you need to put the second sentence. The, the student safety is our number one priority. Period. All, allowing guns on school property. Oh, which one do you mean, Jackie? No, so, I think gun safety. Student, allowed say student gun safety yeah, right. is our number one priority. Period. All right. And go to the next statement. Inability to monitor or to leg however you want to. Concerns about yeah. compliance. Well, we can't enforce the compliance anyway. It would have to be. It would have to be law enforcement. Mm hmm. Uh, but uh, in, in our school district, the uh, parents must come in the building, leaving the gun unattended. Which would leave the gun unattended, yes. Mm -hmm. Required. Required. Um, we would have no ability to um, identify whether the gun is loaded and locked or not. That all falls under kind of monitoring well, and enforcing compliance, mm -hmm. okay. right? Can we talk about that we have concerns that if this is passed, then other laws like the slippery slope idea, do we want to put yeah. something about that or not? The, the more concise you can be when you're yeah. dealing with the legislature, the better off you are. I think something just about simplicity of the Absolutely, rule. just hit the high so points. Guns are not allowed on school property. That's going to be the easiest to communicate to parents, mm -hmm. whereas this allows gray area and confusion. If it's an we could say we're concerned with the ambivalence this may create. And prefer the simplicity of the no guns. Uh, where it's challenged by spelling. <laughs> no. A. A instead of O. Thomas, don't judge. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I'm laughing because I do the same thing. <laughs> I, I am similarly, I, I am similarly flexible spelling. Um, can we change, um, do our high school kids, um, during school hours, if, if a parent is here to pick them up, do our high school kids are they allowed to walk out of the building without the parent coming in? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 If you have a note, if they have a note. Uh, so if they have a note. That's why that often requires. Yeah, but I was thinking of put almost always or parents can call nearly in always. And then they can't right? meet the Not for drop off really? always, right? So right. Even at the middle school, I just, if, okay. like if, if I drop my daughter off late after a doctor's appointment, she can just go in. Right. They can so how about um, um, right? often yeah. how are usually no. required? Um, you know what? I would oh, say it, it is often required. <coughs> Parents are required. required. The primary level. And it's always required. So even school, if you pick your middle school Barbara. student up back right. to pick that up, I need yeah. to go in. Yeah, in middle school you have it's to. It's only the high school that you. It's the high school. How about so uh, <laughs> for many for many school levels, it's required to. Parents are often required. I don't see why. Yeah, they're at most for school level. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's on. 
That's better. Are you, am I like, are we editing this for real? Because it should say school district would have difficulty monitoring, monitoring and enforcing compliance. Bullet number two. Yeah. It's the word two. Mm -hmm. Can take out the word two. Right, right, Kelly? Okay. You'll look this over. <laughs> and we move two yeah. and four after difficulty. Uh, difficulty monitoring. It's like me on Google Docs, except in person. Yeah. <laughs> Monitoring. Monitoring. Monitor everything engaged. We can enforce. Enforcing compliance is not our job. Mm. There's no way we can enforce compliance on a law unless it has directly to do with dealing with students. So. Well, are we responsible for monitoring it now as it stands? Have no guns on the board? monitoring piece is fine. The enforcing piece That's up to the police department. Okay, then just take out enforcing compliance. Monitoring this law as written. I think that's like fine. It. Like we don't have to have Put a down. gazillion <laughs> reasons. I, I agree. I think that's fine. I just think that I might add something, and maybe it's from up and student safety as our number one priority, um, but adding something to say that, you know, having guns on school grounds increases the likelihood of accidents. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, could we add, like, student safety is our number one priority. We believe any weapon on school grounds is contrary to this. Well, our SROs have weapons. So, civilian weaponry. We don't want to get too this? much up there. Current prohibition of guns on school property makes tragedy less likely to happen. Yeah. Yep. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. That's a good word. Instead of student safety or mm -hmm. after? Uh, get you in touch with main school management and they'll take care of it for you. It's, um, What's the timing of it? Like, would I be back for middle school pickup? <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah, probably, probably don't. don't. <laughs> 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 but since we're both sitting here, she would read it for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also um, Rebecca Millette is on the education committee. Yeah. So, we could also provide it to her as well. Yeah. yeah I, I, think we, I think we take Senator up on her offer mm -hmm. if she's yeah. willing and she's going to be there anyway. Okay. <laughs> Unless she's in another hearing. Yeah. We'll, we'll check with her. So we'll just, um, do you want to put it on school board letterhead and then uh, signed yep. and dated and then we'll send and it send out. send a copy to main school management. Okay. To who up there, Jackie, in particular person? Be, either Steve or Vicki. Steve Bailey? Steve Bailey or Vicki Wall. Okay. Because I, I imagine that um, Senator Millette cannot read it from 
So I also included in this slide deck um, who all of our representatives are, so that way you have their email addresses. So if as you're staying up to speed on all of these um, bills that we shared tonight, and plus there's more, I only highlighted a few to keep a watchful eye on. There's many more, and as I look at the list, it changes. Um, there's a link to that in here, but then this way, if you wanted to contact them directly or work with Donna or the communications committee to um, share other um, positions, that I think that's a healthy practice for us, as I said earlier. But that's here in the slide, so it's all in one thing for you. Well, I just, I just had a question, because I know as a board we tend to, you know, we, we do work as a group, so if we wrote a letter, like an individual letter, that would be from us personally, or would we say we're a school board? You know, that's what I just wondered. Well, normally, we, you know, we always work <coughs> as a group. So how does that? I, I think you could. Could you say like parent of Scarborough student, board of education member? Could yeah, she say? Sure. I'm just asking. It's just because I didn't want to. If I yep. did yep. something, you is could that say not? you're a Scarborough resident and you also serve on the Scarborough school board and okay. support the right. board's position. No, but if I would like say I wanted to talk about well, one of the other. Some yeah. other things. And you're just, it's like you're saying what your job is. Yep. You're not speaking for the board. Yeah. No, I'm saying different than board. this, what you're saying, you're sending a collective, the, the Scarborough Board yeah. of Education. No, I'm saying like if on another topic I'm sending a letter, just me. Yep. I just, you can sign it. So I can say that I, am, I also serve on the board. Any, anytime I have addressed a committee up there, it's always been the board's representative presenting the board's <laughs> opinion. But, you're, but you are a representative. Correct. But anybody who wishes to testify can can testify on behalf of the board's position. But she's asking if she Wait. can just email not not representing the board. But she can testify yes. as an individual and yes. say she is Absolutely. a member yeah. of the... Yeah. 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 Okay. I just wanted just to Just because you're sitting here doesn't take away your individual rights to... <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other okay. questions about that? So again, when you get this document where it says new bills, you'll see that it's underlined. That's a link that takes you right to the main school management site, and you can, they organize it really nicely so that there's like the bill, the title, um, and then a little blurb about it. It's a good way to stay informed. So the other thing we had on the agenda tonight, yeah is for um, FY19 school budget communication strategy. I'm just noticing the time. We spent a little bit more time than what we had planned on that um, first topic, but I think it was a good um, process for us to go through. What I was thinking with this is um, we obviously have a very active communication subcommittee who does a lot of work around the budget. Um, and Jody recently shared with all of us, um, I think you shared it with everybody, or maybe it was just me. I don't know what you mean. Um, <laughs> the webinar around story, using stories and telling stories as a form of communication to get your message out. And it's something that we've talked a lot about, um, and maybe this isn't for tonight, but one of my wishes or dreams, if you will, um, is to create a communication library that houses, like, what are the key points that, like, what are the stories we're going to tell? Um, not just about the budget, but in general. Um, for example, today when we were at the main superintendent's conference, winter conference, um, there was a superintendent from Oregon speaking, and he was talking about, you know, their graduation rates. And, like, for them, they really emphasize their graduation rates and their attendance rates as they're looking at instructional equity for all students. Um, and they look less at their state test, which is smarter balance. Um, so the messages that they're sending are, like, around the fact that X percentage of their ninth graders are on track for graduation or X percentage of, you know, the opportunity gaps that they're closing in terms of graduation rates or access to higher education or to career technical education. Um, and so I just, I, it would be helpful for me because I, I said this, I feel like I said this all last year, everybody wants like the one pager and I'm just like, 
your one pager is different than your one pager is different than what Dylan wants on his one pager. But if we had, if I knew certain data points that you wanted, we wanted to be able to communicate, um, we could do the background work, we could create the visual for it, um, and then we could talk about is this a social media communication? Is this something we would like to um, have published in the leader? Is this something we want to just have in our budget book? Um, so I don't know if there's things that you're already thinking about in terms of what those key communications might be. And maybe if we just brainstorm that a little bit, then we can bring back some um, examples of what it might look like to another meeting. So Julie, sorry, just to clarify, are you saying you want to have you want to have ready um, like a story or something to talk about for the most, I don't know, frequently requested data points? Yeah, so that so you can, when somebody asks you, you'll be able to like... Not just when somebody asks us, but so that we are controlling the headline, if you will. And so that we're telling the, inf we're sharing the information in a way that's easy to understand that matters most to our organization. Rather than what happened last year was we were always reacting to that one-off question that you had. And so that would send us off to answer, you know, uh, one of our community members' questions, and then um, it might, and sometimes it might be labor intensive, or it might require a lot of research to, depending how specific the question was, and that sucks up a lot of our time, um, as opposed to us saying, like, what is it that we want our community to know about our organization, and how are we going to share it in a more um, digestible form? Like, for example, enrollment. That question comes up all the time, right? And so it's not just as easy as saying enrollment's declining mm -hmm. because it's a, you have to do a whole analysis, right? And you have to look at it over time, both what happened in the past and also what's projected to happen in the future. So for me, I think about how do I boil that down into a visual and like two or three sentences that tells that story about enrollment um, so that folks feel equipped with um, accurate information. Because yes, our enrollment is declining, but what you also have to notice is that our K-2 enrollment is going to be increasing next year by as many as projected to be as 10 to 15 students at each of our K-2s. That has a major impact, right? But our Wentworth enrollment and our middle school enrollment is projected to decline while our high school enrollment is going to be slightly increased based on our projections. So it's not just as easy as looking at the bottom line and saying the overall number of students is less because that shifts the needs of our organization. So that's a, a long-winded explanation. And um, But I think the story isn't, the, isn't, well, our population is going to be increasing at the primary schools and decrease. I don't think that's the story. I think the story is this year we, we felt the the change in student population in that we had shifted teachers or had, I can't, I don't remember the whole story, but you know the story, <laughs> about uh, we had one less kindergarten teacher or whatever it was and then we had to shift them to a first grade because the enrollment was so high and blah, blah, like that's the story about now we had these classes that had 21 that isn't as comfortable for parents and, and we don't feel yeah. comfortable with that the whole blue point shift, story. yeah, the blue tell point the blue point story. story, the blue point story. So it has to be like an em not an emotional story where people are you know holding, <laughs> no, but like telling that story, like, story. A story that people can uh, yeah. remember, because that's the point is you want people to remember like I am part of it. I remember it's Julie saying something about the like, kindergarten mm -hmm. and the first grade teachers is right before school, and that's really hard for new parents and new. Um, so the students. question is, do you tell? last year's story or do we tell this year's story of what we're, what we're you, seeing in the I don't think you might not know, know what this year's story is yet. But the, well. we have to make budget decisions now based on those projections to what this year's story right. is going so, to be. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're making decisions based on the evidence that we have going forward for this next year. Mm -hmm. But for example, we did the same thing last year and what we found out in August two weeks before school started was mm, the right. story. And I think that blue point story tells 
that tells them what you're trying to say about the shifting, you know, okay, well, our total population is down, but look what happened at the K-2 level, you know, right. because they're, I, I think that explains it. And when we cut instead so close, of close, right. it's a huge impact that doesn't give us the flexibility to, to shift. We had to really make some changes that, that kids, that kids felt, parents felt, and it was it was really hard that first week of school. I mean, that's just one example, but that's the enrollment story that, as opposed to the data, as opposed to the data. chart and the graph that or I you saying, right. well, when you look at the total enrollment, you know, the high school might be going down, but the K twos are going up. Like that, you know, that story tells them that, but it also is like, well, yeah, it's like this is actually what will happen. Right, and we could have avoided all, like, that problem. Right, had those kids who challenge. thought they had one teacher and, you know, anyway. Right. Um, I think it's... Oh, <laughs> um, I'm really glad that we're having uh, even a little bit of this conversation right now because Larissa is going to be coming to our communications meeting on Monday to talk about her four-pager that she wants okay, to work right, on. Right. Right. So, like, enrollment. Yeah. Bullet points like that, like, mm -hmm. really commonly asked and important topics that we feel like need to be highlighted. We can talk about how they're highlighted in the meeting, but if yeah. we wanted to just get some right. bullet points, that would be nice. Yeah, so what else? Yep. Administrative costs. Seems like that's something I'd like okay. to hear people I have two things. complain, even though that's not a... I mean, we do a great job in this town, but I think that is something that people don't understand. And so I think it's an easy thing to say, oh, administrative costs. Right. Mm -hmm. But even though they're not, I know and I, the I've reality seen all, I've seen all the charts. Yep. But you know, I've seen all yep. the charts, and I know they're not. Right. But that's I think that's an easy thing for people to say that, mm -hmm. not knowing. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good one. Jack, did you yeah. have one? Two things. One has to do with this setup here. Symbolically, half the people have their backs to any audience who might be here. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think, uh, I was surprised to see it. It just be flipped the other way. I think it's set up like this because it was last night, this way, so the uh, council, council has it. So they probably just didn't break it down. Mm -hmm. But you're right, if you flipped it, you would have right. it more open. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, I think that we should put up a survey asking parents whose children are not in our schools where they are and why. Oh, you mean in private schools? Or do you mean? Yes. Okay. And here's my reasoning. I think it's important for us to know that parents will send their children to parochial schools because they went or they believe in the parochial education. Uh, it it it's a, has nothing to do with the Scarborough school system. It's a philosophy. Mm -hmm. Some people will send their children uh, to the virtual school because they think that their child can, for whatever reason, doesn't, uh, they can get a better education. It's more comfortable for them. We may not agree with them. We think that the children need to socialize more, but I think we need to get a handle on where they are and why they're there, and what grade level. Yeah, and I think it would be easy to do. Um, sometimes we know where they are and sometimes we don't. Um, but I think the other thing to remember is that there is a law in Maine where you have school choice. And so some um, some people are requ will request a superintendent's agreement so that their child can go to another district for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a process for reviewing that. But you're Absolute. right. You have a lot of choices. You can choose to have a school. You can choose to virtual school. You can choose to send to a private school. Um, so, But here's what the point that I think we need to make. Parents need to make what they feel is the best decision for the education of their child. It's a parent's decision. If the parents don't think that they have a say in what we're doing, I don't want them telling us how to do it. I want them to work with us 
on educating their children. But I think what, what I, I am understanding from this conversation is that we're trying to find out as the budget comes up, what are the roadblocks that we keep hearing year in and year out? But we need to know why. That's the point I'm trying to make. Why they're choosing other schools. Pardon me? You, we need to know why they're choosing other schools? Yes. I, I truly believe that that's only going to help us. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a large population that don't go to public schools? In well, I don't know. But here's what I think. Building in Scarborough has not ceased. You look around at the new neighborhoods coming up every year. Those children haven't hit our schools. I'm not saying the ones in the new buildings. I'm saying that. I think we should have, if, if we had every child who lives in town going to our school, <coughs> we'd be overwhelmed. So don't get me wrong, I think private education <laughs> helps us out. But I also think that, that when people talk about declining enrollments, we need to have an answer for that beyond beyond the fact that it it doesn't affect the budget because it's two students in second grade, it's three students in fifth, whatever it happens to be. Well, I think part of But the gross number, if we knew the gross number, it might help. Well, and I think one of the things we have to think about is, you know, who has access to housing in our community and then what happens once their children graduate. Um, they might be choosing to downsize into one of our growing 55 plus communities so then that housing becomes available for others to move into. But who can access housing in Scarborough? That's a big factor on our enrollment. Um, there's not a lot of really affordable starter homes for young families. But the fact that our enrollment is showing that as our, as our students are graduating, we're going to have this influx of younger students. Obviously, then they're going to grow up through our system. And so it's kind of like this right now is what our enrollment looks like at each phase level. So um, is it just a cycle or is this part of a cycle or is the enrollment going to increase and be here to stay as more and more housing is available? Those are all things that we're, we're looking at. Um, and, but the bottom line is we can't discount what enrollment looks like at our K-2s because we have space issues with them, right? Even though we will have space available in some of the other schools. So that's a part of it too, but I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying and I'm curious too if we can get the exact or close to an estimate of numbers of how many students are choosing other schools. I mean for years, you know, uh, I've had parents say to me, Jackie, I'm sending my son to Chevrolet, or I'm sending my daughter to Macaulay, or I'm sending the children to Waynefleet, or whatever it happens to be. And just because they believe in it, mm -hmm. I've, I've only had one parent in all the years I've been on the board, somebody I've known very well, uh, he and his wife knocked on my door, quite frankly. They are out for, we're sending our son uh, to the Christian school and we wanted you to know because he can talk his way out of anything and and he has those teachers wrapped right around his finger and he isn't doing his homework and we're going to make sure that it gets done daughters went to school here and graduated. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was the individual child. Yep. And, but I've never had somebody say to me, I'm taking my kid out because it's a bad school district. Never. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things I think that came up last year a lot, and I'm just looking back at one of the things that we wrote, um, was the cost per pupil and sort of what that 
encompasses. It's not just um, looking at our neighbors and how do we compare to our neighbors, but what do what services do we provide for our students at that price? I think the the town is doing the same sort of thing on you know here's what you pay for taxes, what services do you get for that? Here's how much it costs for us to have a student and here are all of the things that we excel at and why we're the one of the top 10 school districts in the state. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think to share those successes I think is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Connect to the student I think the budget time is when a lot of people kind of listen to what's going on with the school board, you know, and with the schools, whereas other times of the year they might not be paying attention. So this budget time is when a lot of people are paying attention. That's the time to really share those successes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, share what I agree that what our ranking is, bank on that, yeah. and how we got there, what are the things that make that up so that people understand what that ranking means, mm -hmm. and I really highlight the successes of the school system. So when we say the, 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 the MEPRI uh, study that we had done a couple of years ago was exactly that, but it was very jargony, um, very um, scholarly, and not very easy to absorb for your average person who just wants to pick up that one page or four pager. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I think, you know, all the data was there that said, you know, here's what's going on in these other communities, here's what they're spending, and here's what their student outcomes are looking like. Mm -hmm. um, it was a powerful argument, but it wasn't boiled down to the point where people could access it. Right. 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 So when we say ranking, I know that um, I think the Portland Press Herald does some sort of ranking. What what ranking source do we rely on? Years 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 years. But there's another one that comes out that people use all the time online. Oh, yeah, that niche. But that's but that's not. not yeah. Yeah. There, wasn't one, there wasn't there one in the Portland Press Herald where, but it was odd. Like there was, I remember seeing a listing, and we ranked very high, but it was weird. Cape Elizabeth wasn't on the list. Like there were certain schools that weren't on the list, but it just came out like just last, like sometime last year. But I forget what that list was. But I know we did very but well. I think we did and I think it was because of standardized testing. Didn't we decide it, that oh, maybe it was in in the Some people, I think oh, okay, it wasn't on the list. Because there was a couple of schools oh, that weren't on the list. Because they, they didn't, right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. yeah. Do we do like graduation rates? Um, or do we have any data on how many kids stay in school, like two years, three years, four years past? graduating Scarborough High School? We, we are just trying to create some systems and structures to better to stay better connected to our alumni. Right. Um, we just had our first alumni breakfast event last Friday. Um, but that is definitely an area that we can improve on. And that's, you know, so part of it too can be what are the data points that we want to get better at collecting and communicating. So we know our graduation rates. We know um, the percentage of students that commit to going on to a two-year or a four-year college <coughs> or military or workforce. Right. Um, that's data that we have readily available, so we can get that. We can communicate <coughs> that, I would say. I just think college is, actually I went back for, to my school, uh, to my college in the fall, and they just do such an amazing job of sharing the success and making you feel so good about being a part of uh -huh. that school. Do you know what I mean? And so I think that any time we can, we can share that. <laughs> and most of the time those successful storytelling moments are individualized. That they're not talking generalized. It's very much Susie did this or Johnny did that. Yeah. And I think the more that we can include real life examples the more it's going to resonate with people. Oh. Because if we just talk, oh, hey, X percent, it gets lost. So Dylan and Thomas, do you have connections with any Scarborough grads that are doing successful things post high school that you could reach out to and say, like, hey, can you write a paragraph, just kind of where you are and how's it going? I know some. I'm not sure how successful they are, but I know you can look into it. I can get him to do it. Yeah, I think if we could get just a paragraph, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but just like here's, you know, so and so graduated in 2016, doing X, Y, and Z, kind yeah. of a thing. I like you Jeff meet with, did Jeff meet with you? I Jeff Pooler. 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 Pooler.
Maybe it was when George was here that he, he works for the Educational Arts Council or something out of Washington, D.C. So uh, I, I know him well, so I'll get in touch with him. We could have, I think, have more, more information of people who are a little bit older, who have graduated from college and are successful mm -hmm. and now returned and live in Scarborough. Okay. So that if we put out some kind of a, maybe even an ad in, in the leader that said, you know, if you're a SHS graduate and you reside in Scarborough, we'd like to hear from you. Are yeah. you on the school board? A couple of, no, just a couple of questions. Where are you now? Yeah, okay. where are you now? I mean, you, obviously they'd have to be residing here, but tell us about your field of employment, what brought you back to Scarborough, you know, maybe a statement about how your high school education played into your college life. How about Kelly Mullen Martin? I think there's a whole bunch of them. I think there's a lot of them. Yes. There's, there's a lot of them. So many. Yes. I just gave David Momet's right. name. He's a graduate of Scarborough High School, and he's the one who won $50,000 on Shark Tank and started the um, food truck for oh, lobster yeah, out yeah, in yeah, California. The and now he's here in town running the lobster place. He has for like. actually has 14 <laughs> franchises in the country. And mm -hmm. when he was successful with the 50000 Robert Corcoran gave him another 100000 to help his business, and he's been very successful. Is that Saban? Yep. Uh, so if each person at this table had, even if we just had one story, each of us had one story from someone mm -hmm. we know, whether it's yeah. a recent grad, because I think it's important to hear from them. How prepared mm -hmm. were they? Did they feel ready? You know, because yeah. that's, and then how are they faring in this yeah. thing called life? I think that would be. Ask them to infuse in our budget, in our budget book you know, in our yeah. presentation of the budget or on our one pager or and or all of these things also on our website. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the name what are the, the things they graduate from high school and no um graduate I mean postgraduate degree. I think it's something that we can do immediately, quite frankly is to put Mr. Vash on out in front for us because he has written the one act play that's going to be performed <laughs> by our students. <laughs> and so he can blush all he wants, but that, <laughs> that's a tremendous accomplishment for a young person. You're and right. Current students too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like so I think this is yeah. kind of off topic, but ties in a little bit. Um, I went to a Bruins game over winter break and they have this highlight video at the beginning like mm -hmm. gets everyone pumped up, the lights yep. are down, the spotlights are going and you, you start to feel it like I don't know any of these players, I'm just there because it's like hey we're in Boston, it's fun. Right. But you start to feel really excited about it and you're like yeah and the music's pumping and then they have the players start to like talk and just say something about either on the video, on the video yeah. about Boston or the fans or whatever. It's just like a highlight thing. And I kept thinking to myself, this would be so cool if we had like, I don't want to throw out kids' names because I don't, if we had like Thomas talking undertone and then there's the music playing and the Red Storm logo comes out and then there's the football game and then there's a video of the um, yeah. play. Do you understand what I'm trying yeah. to say? Like, yeah, just great. to get people like excited and you feel pride and you're yeah. like, yeah, this is my team. And I don't even know any of these people on this team. But like I was in it. And when would this be used? And it could be on our website. It could be on Channel 3. It could be Blast it on their screen. Yeah. Well, like, we're ready for like the a pump up meeting to be different here. things that kids <laughs> are doing, walking through the halls, high five and then oh, Michael Manfred's talking about <laughs> whatever he's talking about. Like just all these things that get people saying, like, yeah, that's my town. I'm with you. I've got so many people right now. You know, OG winning the Fitzpatrick for the first time for school. Yeah. Right. That is stuff that. We need to be promoting that. People need to see what the kids are doing. The um, that wicked cool fish tank. Oh, I the think that yeah, that those sorts of things. I think blood drive. We need the blood drive. Piece of pee. The no, more things so that are out there, there. real world, real yeah. day right. is going to get people engaged and understand that the money is being spent 
wisely, <coughs> and it's really enriching the students' lives. It's something we should all be proud of. Exactly. Like it, it's the community. Yes. And if so you had that show I, seriously prior to a meeting, not only a school board meeting, but you're going to have a public hearing on the budget, and people come in and they see them on. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. I am not spitting into the wind on this no. one. No, I think it's. But I, uh, it reminds me of, you know, when you go to like the soccer banquet or the, you know, right. the, the, highlight highlight reel. the highlight reel, and it's, mm -hmm. I always get almost teared up when I see right. that highlight reel, even though I only know, like, which is my kid's team, <laughs> it's just, to me, it's just such a huge community moment, mm -hmm. and you're surrounded by everyone that cares about these kids, and I just, I think it's so powerful. So I think oh, we need a PR person. We, we, we have, have we're going to need a series because we have so much content. I mean, that is how awesome our community is. Well, and I think Keith day. Bailey said it, and it struck me when he was here, it was, the, it was the main thing that I took out of that boardsmanship meeting, was that it's a 12-month campaign for us. It's mm -hmm. a 12-month mm -hmm. cycle of, of helping the community see all of the incredible things that our students are doing and our staff are doing and coordinating and events and all of these great things. Yeah. It's a 12 month campaign instead of a, the negative three month campaign or whatever. So yeah. it's, it's building, it's a process and it's building that pride and that excitement over some really positive stories rather than just the facts. Mm -hmm. like, would there be any benefit of having some sort of kind of like what you do with the listen and learn, but like with student and school leaders just kind of talking with the public? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know, just having like uh, coffee and just have the public mm -hmm. come in and talk with. We've talked about that in our communications mm -hmm. meetings a yeah. lot, and I feel like we've talked about it like for a couple of years, but like mm -hmm. highlighting our students and the money you're spending on your taxes, this is you know, this is your outcome, this, you should feel very proud, and here's what these five kids are going to go do after high school. I think there's a story to each student. It might not be everyone's going to college or going into the workforce, but everyone has a story of where they came from and, and where they're going to go, and I just think community members need to hear that because it's a lot of, it's that building in the main part of town, and there's so much more going on inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could be cool for them to see it though too. If you had like an event where you displayed tons of like student like projects that they done, not like an art show, but like any success that we've had or mm -hmm. different projects, not necessarily at the high school, but at all phase levels. Yeah, bring back the science fair or something like that. Cause I think that used to be. We have the science bowl, but I don't know. Oh, okay, the science fair. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, that would be that art show. That comes back this way. So um, you guys are doing exactly what I would hope you would do. I'm just noticing the time, and we also have a couple of executive sessions. Mm -hmm. So in this slide deck, when I share it with you, you're going to notice there's a blank slide here. So you can continue to add ideas. I'm going to chart um, the ideas that we have right in here, and then there will be extra slides where you can just plug in anything you're thinking about. And it doesn't have to just be today or tomorrow. Um, this is an ongoing thing. We're trying to improve our communication. I've been and hearing some really good feedback from people that our communication, they feel like our communication is better, um, is getting better, that we're communicating more, but it's uh, one of those things that you can always improve. Um, so we can use this as sort of a way to capture those ideas and then just appreciate that I love the idea of like a Scarborough Pride video. Now I have to like actually have some time to develop that and make that happen. Um, mm -hmm. If we develop videos, and I'm sure there have to be more than one. Mm -hmm. I think that every time there's an event in a building, that you have that going mm -hmm. as people are coming in. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have these screens all over our schools now. Mm -hmm. People will look at them. People will watch them. People okay, love to put the link into that little document you're going to share okay. with the, of the Bruins highlight film because I, I don't want it to get the only person who would go to a Bruins game and be like, oh, we should do it for the school board. I literally was <laughs> like, I was typing on my phone. I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And <laughs> 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 
Um, but it's just, it's not a lot of talking. It's just like an undertone mm -hmm. of, yeah. mm -hmm. you get the point. Okay. We've, we've been to games. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Good to get the right rock and roll award. We have wonderful students, and we need to showcase that. But could we, could we have students speak at, at some of the board meetings that... Yes, like, like, yeah. like, like, like Dylan was saying, I just think that's an awesome idea. Mm -hmm. All right, write that down on this thing, because it's mm. true that like the three of us sit at our communications meeting and come up with all these things, but we also need to hear, like I think it's really informative from Leanne and Hillary to hear, you guys are the new ones, so it's, it's nice to hear what your thoughts are with regards to communicating the budget, because you weren't on this side of it last year, right. and we sort of get consumed in the same old, same old. So. so you know how I, at our business meetings I usually do recognitions and then we have student reports. I'm wondering if we could challenge our students here to possibly bring a student to showcase. Interestingly enough, that was something that a student had asked me the other day uh, because there is the environmental club wants to talk about some of the projects they're doing. And they were like, can we come in during like, a student report of recognition and ask and talk about it. So. I, yes. I, I have an entire list of people who would like to come. So, so okay. we'll make a slide in here that's just, um, I'm going to call it student showcase until somebody comes up with a different name. Um, and then you can start to type in sort of use whether it's a club or a group that you know. Definitely. would be, And then we, can just, we just have to schedule them uh, well in advance so they know. Okay. It didn't say a word. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> Anybody else before we move on? It's quarter nine, so maybe we should move. Am I going to have to meeting? I was having trouble. I started hearing everything in an announcement. It was like, student showcase. Come on now. It looks like you're the first thing to do. All right. It's a game show. Uh, I'll, get my, I'll get my 12-year-old to get this something on YouTube. Don't <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, so we're just going to move on to 7.0, and I'm going to put these together. So I need a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA subsection 4056D for the purpose of discussing the Scarborough driver's contract not to return to public session and a motion to go into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA subsection 4056D for the purpose of discussing the superintendent's contract not to return to public session. So, so second. Very good. Are there, uh, I don't see any questions about that. All in favor? And 7 plus 2. And I need a motion to adjourn at this time. So moved. Second. All in favor?